I'm in the ninth day of a water fast. Oh, uh, it's, it's really not. <laughs> I don't, you know, the Bible says, don't, you know, put oil on your face when you're fasting. Like, and it talks about, like, if you, if you do it for people, you've lost your reward. I'm definitely not doing it for anybody except him. There are things in me that need to die. So I'm going to starve them out. It sounds crazy, but I'm not kidding. I love Jesus with all my heart. But as I'm entering in this place, I realize there's a lot of things inside of me that I don't like. People are like, what, is, what do you mean? I thought you were perfect. <laughs> there's no one that's perfect but Jesus. Like, I am not perfect. As a matter of fact, I am wrecked. He's just, he's just, I should have did this at the beginning of the pruning thing. It would have been a lot quicker. <clears throat> I can't even tell you all the things that he's showing me. There, it's, not, it's not blatant sin. It's not something that I'm like, it's just there are things that I cannot carry into the next season. And see, I don't believe God wants anybody to carry stuff from last season into this one. I believe that we always need to grow. But I am in the most crazy place I've ever been at. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. I know that God is good, and I know he's good all the time. But he is fathering me in an amazing way. <laughs> he's teaching me about humility. <laughs> oh, He's teaching me about perspectives, the way you think, the way you communicate the way you hear. Because you can be in a conversation and not even be listening to the person in front of you. But you can carry on a conversation, yet answer them, but still didn't hear what they said. And I don't think it's selective hearing. I just think it's foggy hearing. We can't afford, we can't afford to have foggy hearing when it comes to our Father. <laughs> Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice, and the strangers, they will not follow. I have to be able to distinguish what is the fathers and what is the strangers. And I understand if it doesn't line up with God's word, it's not his voice. God will violate, he'll violate your understanding of the word, but he won't violate his word. He might violate your perception, like here's one. You're taught your whole life, God doesn't heal, and then you get healed. That's a violation. That's a good one. Are you with me? Ben said something earlier that was so, I mean, uh, he said a lot of things that were amazing. But this one word that caught my attention that's been, that's been gripping me since I got saved is rest. I'm adamant to teach about righteousness. I'm adamant to teach about holiness. Holiness is not something that you can do. Holiness is the byproduct of being right with God. But if we don't understand what being right with God means, holiness is far away. If I don't understand I'm right with the one that created me, that I can actually come to him at any time, and he's never upset at me, he's never mad at me. But he wants to father me. I have taught and will continue to teach identity. Identity is a word that a lot of people are using. But the identity that I want you to understand is that in Ephesians, in Ephesians 5, it says, be an imitator of God. That's a ridiculous identity that none of, them can pull, none of us can pull off. Are you with me? God said, imitate me. Not me, God. Be imitators of God, dear children. How can I imitate the one that created me? I want you to think with me. I know it, it sounds like, well, no, we just read over it. No, no, no. He said, be imitators of God, dear children, and walk in love. 
God is love. Walking in love is what this is about. But it's not love, feel good love. It's love, God like love. Are you with me? <clears throat> if I love you and I'm an imitator of God, when you're in a place that you shouldn't be, I'm going to warn you because it's not safe for you. If I don't love you, I'll let you go. That's some of the hardest, that's one of the hardest things for people to do, especially with somebody that you're really close to. You're hanging out with your friends and one of your friends does this and the last thing you wanna do is like say, hey, listen, that's not cool. But that's the first thing that the gospel says to do. And then people say, hey, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. You don't want that. One day there'll be a judgment day, but it'll be a good day if you listen to it now. <clears throat> Do you know that one day we're going to stand before him and he's going to judge us, all of us. It's the tr he's the judge. But the Bible does say we don't judge those that are outside but we judge those that are inside. Are you with me? What does that mean? <sighs> judgment, sometimes we think judgment is condemnation. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So when I bring correction or I talk to somebody, it's not about something that needs to shift. It's not so I can get my way. It's because I see a car wreck about a mile down the road that you're about to head into, and I want to warn you before it happens. And sometimes we get so upset when that happens, we go to another church, and then we go to another church, and then we go to another church, and we're like, you know what? They all are doing the same thing. Well, maybe you're doing the wrong thing. Are you guys okay? All right. Just one. I wasn't even prepared. I am. I've got one of those Bibles to just open up to where you need it to. It actually really did. It's crazy. Thanks, Lord. He know he has to be really tender with me right now. I cry like all the time. You have no idea. I'm like, my like everything is heightened. Like, like little things are like. You okay? I was in the car today and I don't even know what was happening. We were listening to something. We were driving for hours and there was a, uh, I found a, did you ever hear Hakuna Matata? Okay. So it means no worries. We're in the midst of traffic, wreck. Like there's a wreck. It's traffic. We're driving. We're supposed to be back in a couple hours. It took six. We're supposed to be like, but it was like crazy. So I put that song on and like, it was like this techno beat with Hakuna Matata. It was like Lion King. I don't know why, I just put it on, and it started singing, and it means no word, and I'm like, <laughs> because of Hakuna Matata. It's our problem free philosophy, Hakuna Matata. Look, you all know it. Why don't you live it? I'm talking to me too. I am talking to me too. <laughs> oh, I gotta hold it together for this meeting. I am so undone. I'm trying to like be lighthearted. I'm just really being honest with you. I'm 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 broken. You know, I think I shared last week about the wreck, uh, the, the accident that I had and what I saw. Like when I walk up to a Christian and say, hey man, how are you today? And then we have a conversation and I share about how much I love the Lord. And they say, blank and yeah, me too. It sounds funny, but it breaks my heart. <laughs> that shouldn't be in the same sentence. I don't, this is not legalism. I'm like, I'm in love with God and I, I love him with everything in me. 
And I'm broken at the state of the church at looking at where we're at as far as our intimacy with God, our relationship with God. And I know that the one thing that separates us from intimacy, no, there's a lot of things, but it has to start with a condemnation-free, guilt-free, shame-free conscience that's in rest because of the blood of Jesus when you say yes. That's why when I say when you come to Jesus, if you come to Jesus just for a better day, you're greatly deceived. Because he didn't say, here, have your best day. He said, hey, give me your day. Like he says, give me everything. Look, we can't profit if we keep the world. Jesus says that all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. Love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And the second one is like it. Love our neighbor as ourself. And it says all the law and the prophets. So, so sometimes we think that Jesus swept the commandments like away. He came to fulfill them. He actually didn't sweep them away. He intensified them. <laughs> but sometimes we think because we're in this place of grace, and I'm not talking about like hyper grace where, where that's, that's how you, that's, gosh. Help me, Lord. I don't want to sound mean. I don't, I love Jesus and I love people. But I love you enough to tell you the truth and I won't sit up here and love you and tell you what you want to hear so your ears get tickled, you go home and your life doesn't change. That's not my, that's not my life. I'm accountable for you. And my job is to make you more accountable than the time you came in here. I know it's ridiculous and crazy. My job is not to just empower you. My job is to, is to watch the things in your life cut out that don't need to be there because they're hurting you and they're hurting your family and they're hurting people around you. Are you with me? So Jesus didn't say, I'm doing away with all the commandments. As a matter of fact, all you have to love God, love your neighbor as yourself. In love God, there's a lot more than just say that you love God. There's live like you love God. There's act like you love God. There's walk like you love God. There's talk like you love God. There's actually spending time with God when no one's looking like you're loving God. There's not just coming to a building to hang out, but actually spending time with them. There's actually loving God with more than 10 minutes of devotions a day loving God. That's not law. That's love. So if my mind and my heart and my, my everything is focused upon him all the minutes of the day, that's actually what he wants. He didn't pay a price for you to just come on a Sunday night or a Wednesday or have a small group. He paid a price for you to live and be an imitator of God and walk in love. What does love look like, Jesus? What did Jesus walk like? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Help. The commandments. When God said, love the Lord thy God with all my heart, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself, how can you love your neighbor when you backbite and hate your neighbor? How, where, where is love in that? How can you love your neighbor when you say, well, you can love them, but you don't have to like them? <clears throat> if God said, I love you, but I don't, I'm sorry if you've been taught that, but that's not the Lord. If God loves you and not likes you, he tolerates you. Therefore, you're just barely loved. <laughs> if you're loved and not liked, that's not the gospel. Jesus didn't say God so loved but didn't like the world that he gave his son. Are you with me? Come on, you got to think with me. Look, if you are loved and not liked then you will love people but just for toleration purposes. And when they turn their back, you'll talk about them. That's not Jesus. That's murder. <laughs> See, when we say we love but we don't like, that means we tolerate. And if you think that, that means that God tolerates you and you're walking on eggshells and you're trying to prove that you're worthy instead of walking like you already are. Real grace empowers real truth to happen. I need God's grace so I can walk in love. 
Walking in love doesn't, doesn't be, hey man, I love you, 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 hey man, I love you. It's not just words. If somebody upsets you, the first thing you do is you're supposed to take that to the Father. I mean, if you can do it right then when you're in front of them and tell them, I forgive you or I love you or I'm sorry. Sometimes we say we're sorry, but if they don't say okay, then we're really not sorry. <laughs> someone gets upset at you and you say, I, I just want to be practical. If, if, if someone gets upset at you, and you say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. And they say, you should be. This feeling of not really being sorry tries to creep in. <laughs> so you saying you're sorry were just words because you, all you said it was to get them to say, okay, I forgive you. It's not about that thing. That is, that is skin deep, buddy. That's just your words, but you have to be careful. You have to diligently Protect your heart, because out of your heart, all issues of life come. I need to protect my heart. How do I protect my heart? By self-preservation and boundaries? Do I put boundaries around me so nobody can get to my heart? You're done. What you are is a target for the devil. I'm going to protect myself from you. I'm going to protect myself from you. Don't let them get close to me. Don't let them get close to me. That's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's psychological jargon. That's junk. <laughs> if someone despitefully use you, uses you, how does that make you feel? What, what could you do if somebody spitefully uses you with wrongful intentions? What do you do? How do you handle that thing? You pray for them. Not like this. Ooh, I can't believe they did that. Mm. Wait till you hear this. And they said this, and they could, and you know what? It what? I'll tell you what, I'm so tired of this. You know what? We need to pray for them. That's not Jesus, man. How about someone hates you, someone is angry towards you, and you actually go and you don't tell anybody. You just keep it to yourself. But yourself and God should be one. So you're actually not keeping it to yourself. You're bringing it before your Father. And you come into your prayer room, Father, I thank you so much. They have no idea who they are because they wouldn't say that if they did. And I'm asking you to bless them. Lord, I ask you to turn their world upside down. That you, would, that you would shower your love and your kindness upon them in such a way that they would be overtaken by your goodness and your mercy, God. I thank you, Lord. I bless them. I choose to bless them right now with everything in me. And you pray until that stupid feeling that you used to have leaves. I'm telling you. Because venting doesn't shut it down. What venting does is give somebody else the wrong lens to now see them through. Because now what you've done is they might have saw them a different way. But you gave them a new lens. You gave them the you lens. You gave them the new, the, the new you lens to see them through. So they can't see them through person. Let's say somebody, somebody at school or somebody at work upsets you. And nobody knew about it but you two. And all of a sudden they explode on you. And then you try to reach out to a couple of friends, but they work there too. So now your couple of friends have the view that you gave them, and they come up to them and say, hey man, how you doing today? Mm hmm But you gave them the wrong lens. We need to see through the lens of Christ, man. <laughs> if you think that I never have that stuff come up, you're wrong. It's daily. And I cry out in my heart, I cry out for them, because it's not about being hurt by people. When love becomes real, 
It's not being hurt, it's hurting for. Hurting for, why? Because if that doesn't end, they're going to stand before the judgment seat of God and answer for it on that day. Some people are like, well, good, they're going to get what they deserve. <clears throat> you just lost it. Now you'll get what you deserve. <laughs> Guys, this is real. The enemy is after this. He wants to torment this. He wants you to go through the motions of saying yes to God, but never through the actions of living your life a yes to God. And rest is the answer. And it's not a day. It's a life. It is not... Do you know that you can take a day off and spend none of it with God and have nothing in there? Do you know that you can take a vacation and spend no time with God and come back worse than what you left? Because you think everything's going to go away. And then you come back from vacation and wham, it slams you and the enemy knows it. He knows. He knows you didn't spend time with God. He knows you weren't praying. He knows you weren't going after heaven. The enemy knows. And he knows what it was like when you left. He knows how upset you were and how stressed out you were and how anxious you were and how worried you were and how mad that everybody, oh, everybody just works on my nerves. And then when you go on vacation, you're like, yeah, wow, awesome time. Whoa, we're doing cool stuff. And all of a sudden, on your flight home, oh no, oh my gosh, tomorrow's Monday. Lord, Am I just like, I know I'm not speaking to just the air. Um, it looks like it because I can't hardly see you, but <clears throat> that's no way to go through life. There's no way to go through life. I hope I'm making sense a little. In 2 Timothy 3.16, It says all scripture, all scripture is inspired or breathed by God. So every bit of scripture, every bit that's in the book, the whole Bible, all of it is breathed by God. People say, well, that's translated by man. That's all right. You get alone with God and he'll translate it for you. I promise you. I promise. People are like, well, that's just, I mean, that's man's translation. <laughs> If you would say that you love God, you have to honor the infallibility of his word because God's magnified his word above his own name. God and his word are one. So for you to say that you love God but not love his word and not believe or trust in it doesn't happen. It's impossible. So God's word, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, <clears throat> for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Reproof, correction. So I want to bring, I want to, I want to be taught God's word. I want reproof. Let's look at the Greek. Conviction, evidence. Reproof. So God's word is amazing and it's used for teaching. It's used for conviction. <clears throat> That's amazing. Why? Because if I sit and I read God's word and I believe that I can't get it with my brain, God has to reveal it to me, it has to come alive. Then that word's going to come and convict me of all the areas of my life that need to change. This is why it's so important to dive into the Word of God and ask God to cut you deep. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide and separate the soul from the spirit. The confusing part of that 
is that sometimes when we hear, going to save souls, going after souls, going after souls, and then all of a sudden it's spirit, soul, and body, we get kind of thrown. God's talking about the three parts of man. He wants our spirit born again, hooked with Holy Spirit. Your spirit gets that word, no question, no question. Like the Holy Spirit communicates with your spirit. Your soul is not in first place. If you read the Word of God with just your brain, what you're trying to do is book smart, and book smart won't change your life. Book smart doesn't change your life. Bible smarts is different. Spirit, soul, and body. He wants to take the Word of God, which is living and powerful, and divide your soul from your spirit. So what happens is God causes division here with your thinking because your, your soul is your, is your emotions, your mind and your will. That's what it's referred to, the rational part of man. So what God wants to do is he wants to fix the irrational thoughts and thinking processes that go through you and the issues of life that stem from your heart he wants to because even in the Word of God, it says the Word of God is alive, living and powerful, sharp and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide and separate your soul from your spirit. It says your, your joint from the marrow. And then it says it judges the thoughts and intents of your heart. Here's the deal. If I get God's Word and I put it where it's supposed to be, and I would actually humble myself, get to a place where I know that there's no possible way for me to get this logically. You cannot get it logically. You can take the most brilliant people, put the Bible in front of them, they'll read a little and shut it. Why? Because it is not meant for the carnal man. It's not. The carnal mind, the educated mind, the logical mind, it says it is at enmity against God. It is at war against God. So you can be born again. You can say yes to Jesus. You can come to an altar. You might even come up and repent and be totally blown away. Totally like, oh my gosh, Lord, you forgive me. And it's authentic and it's real. Then walk away and do nothing to crush the carnal mind that still speaks louder than your spirit. And so what we're dealing with and what is breaking my heart is that I know that there are Christians that don't want to live that way, yet they're living that way. And they're caught in this Romans 7 cycle where even though they don't want to do the things they're doing, they're doing them anyway. And God says no, but they're doing them anyway. And all of a sudden they get caught in this hamster wheel. Now mix guilt, condemnation, and shame inside of there. It's a wheel that you can't see. You can't see it, but it's this cycle of life that's repetitive. So all of a sudden, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, and your whole life is about begging forgiveness for the things that you wish you never did yesterday and today. But you know and looking forward to doing them again tomorrow, so what does that mean? You worry, you can't sleep, you're up at night because the same thing is happening again. So now we're totally broken and we're wondering, how am I going to do this? And we come to church so that maybe I can get through another week. No! That is not the gospel. That's not Jesus. He paid a price for you and I to have intimacy, to have relationship. But you cannot have relationship with a cloud of condemnation. You cannot have relationship with a cloud of guilt and shame and doubt. You can't. But God knows. And He wants us to be transformed. But He wants us to dive in. Gosh, when I heard Dan, when I got saved, I was so amazed. I was like, oh my gosh, this guy. How does he get this stuff? And I would ask him questions and man, he'd just, oh my gosh. I'd write down what he said. I'd look in the Bible and be like, I don't even see that. I would sit beside him at meetings and he would speak and I would, I would take the scriptures and write them down. I'd go back in my room and be like, oh God, you're gonna teach me, Lord, I just love you so much. You're amazing. God, I love you. You're so good. Lord, thank you. God, I need you to make what Dan said make sense to my heart. God, I knew. And I knew enough that it couldn't make sense to my brain. It needed to make sense to my heart. Because your heart can take you places your brain cannot even squeeze into. It's with a heart one believes, not with a brain. Are you with me? So I'm like, wow. And I look at the scriptures, nothing. 
I mean, I'd, but well, I don't understand why they go together. Why? Because it was Dan's revelation that he was getting from the Lord. So when I went into my bedroom, I'm like, Lord, just make this my revelation. I tried everything. You don't know. You just don't know. <laughs> but you know what did work? When I opened up the Bible, I'm like, God, I need your help. Oh, you see, this is still today. It's not any change. I got up early this morning and spent, and spent an hour and 45 minutes with the Lord. Why? Because I don't get it. God, I lack wisdom today. I, I need your help. Please help me. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. God, help me. I want to be a better leader. Help me to hear your voice, God. I need you to speak to me today. Jesus, help me. Help me. Please help. I'm crying out. God, I need your help. I lack wisdom. <laughs> oh, gosh. And the Lord's just like waiting for me to be done. Father, see, to me, he's not a mean dad. He's an amazing father that always has good thoughts for me. See, the more I find out what the word of God says, the more I know him. God's word says his thoughts for me outnumber all the grains of sand, all the grain, grains, you know what I mean, of sand, each grain representing one thought for my welfare. God has more thoughts than all the grain of sand in the whole world and every thought is for my welfare. That's my father. I got to learn some of those thoughts because I can't afford to think thoughts that aren't in his head. To set my mind on things above, not beneath. To go after the reality of why he saved me. He didn't save me to let me sit back there. He didn't save me just so I could say I believe in God. If guilt, shame, condemnation, and the, the deeds that we're doing that aren't godly. Like if you were to look at these commandments, Jesus says, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you think that lying's okay with God, you're wrong. You shouldn't bear false witness. God didn't do away with the commandment of lying. Like... Graven images. Here's a graven image. I think that God is really good and he understands that I can live in sin and it's okay with him. It's not okay. God doesn't want us to live an act of sin, yet be saved. If we say we love God, yet we love sin, something's wrong. Am I speaking to just the walls? Like if I say that I love God 10 minutes of my day and the world 10 hours, how can the love of God be in me? How can, how can I really love God if I'm going to spend hours and hours and hours not even thinking about him? This isn't a spanking. I'm telling you, there's a way to be free from this. I thought about everything else but God my whole life. And I didn't even think that he was real. And then he saves me. What kind of love is that? I didn't give him one second of my time for 34 years, nothing. And God saves me from getting shot. Tells me, ask me if I'm ready to live for him yet. <laughs> ah! I did five and a half months I knew that Dan had something real, but I didn't know how to get it. And I needed to appease my girlfriend to keep her to stay, Jackie. So I went through the motions, but I never, ever, I just, I couldn't pray. I didn't read. I didn't care. It was all about me. I manipulated people. I would go to church and sing really loud in those five and a half months before I got shot at. I would go on Sunday. First, I'd go there and I'd say, I'm sorry for everything I'm doing during the week. That was my prayer. My prayer life was a pity party for me. God, I did it again. I know you're real because Dan couldn't be the way he is if you're not. 
That was me. And I would call Dan every day. I did it again. I did it again. I did it again. I did it again. And there was a piece of me that felt horrible because I did it again. Thank God there was a seed inside of me. But you know what helps a seed grow? The water of the Word. <laughs> this has to have a more, platen, a more important place than setting it all around our house and never opening it. That's not love. Love is this. God, I have no idea what I'm reading in here. Everything doesn't make sense. But God, if you don't breathe on this, I'll never understand. I don't want to be the way that I am. I need you to open my eyes to what this means. God, it says I was blind, but now I see. But it doesn't seem like I can see very well. Please help me see more. God, I want to see people the way that you see them. I'm tired of being hurt by everybody. Show me what it means to not be hurt. I, I'm talking to a book. People think you're psycho. It doesn't matter. This book will talk back to you. Oh, I'm not kidding. And then what are they going to think? I don't know if this makes any sense. I, I just want to sit and cry. I love Jesus so much, man. You have no idea. I'm like, my, I wake up in the morning, my first thought, Jesus. I like go in the bathroom, brush my teeth. Jesus. I'm not kidding. I think about him all day. Like when everybody's going about their day, I'm like, we, we need to talk about the Lord. We need to, Jesus. He didn't save me so I could have a part-time God in a full-time world. He didn't save me for part-time. None of you are part-time. See, what you don't understand is that you're full-time. You're a full-time Christian. You're a full-time Christ-like one. Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. It was Jesus, the anointed one. And you are a Christian, an anointed Jin, a Christ Jin, a little anointed one. Man, if, if we'd see this, it would become so attractive. And you'd look in the mirror. See, self-righteousness is being right in your own eyes with no help from anybody else. It's the, it's the most nasty sin. Jesus rebuked Pharisees on a consistent basis because self-righteousness promotes hypocrisy. Where they were talking about themselves. It was about their robes. It was about how they prayed. It was about when they prayed. It was about what they did. It was about knowing the law. It was about reading and knowing the Torah. It was about memorizing. It was That's where they gained everything from. That is not what God paid a price for you to do. He didn't pay a price for you to know it, quote it. He paid a price for you to understand it with your heart and to become it. Jesus was the Word made flesh that came and dwelt among men. God wants our flesh to become the very Word that we say we know. It says in Colossians 3.17, which is like one of my favorite scriptures ever, it says, whatever you, whatever you do, doers, whatever you do in word, how can you do a word? Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all as unto the Lord and not for people. So everything that I'm going to do in my life, I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to look out the window. I'm going to ride in a car. I'm going to look at a computer. I am going to read a book. I'm going to draw a picture. I'm going to write some poetry. I'm going to sing a song. I'm going to walk with my wife. I'm going to talk to my kids. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go out to eat. I'm going to watch something on TV. Well, let me ask you, if I'm going to watch TV as unto the Lord, do you think that he's okay with what you're watching? 
That's not legalism. The only reason you do that is because you do not know the love of God. Because when the love of God hits you, the things that make him... <clears throat> God loves sinners, but he does not love sin. Sin separates people from God. So now a sinner comes to Jesus, gives his life to God, gets saved by grace through faith because of Christ Jesus... Now, if that person doesn't understand what they gave their life to, they'll think it's still all about them. If I come to God and I'm told, this is, I said it the other day, a couple of Sundays ago, when, if I come to Jesus for a better day, if I come to Jesus because he's going to bless me, because he's going to give me stuff, and because it just sounds like that's amazing, like who wouldn't try that buzz? Are you with me? Oh, yeah, dude, I mean, I'll try it. This isn't a try it thing. Are you ready to die for what you just committed yourself to? Because I've got news, there's no way for you to go through the Christian life unless you die. Period. So when I said, how many of you prayed for the person that kill him, Lord? People were like, what the fuck? You Satanist? No. Jesus said, he who sin watch, I pray, and, and I'm told I'm going to get a better day, I'm, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get that, and all of a sudden, I read a scripture, it says, he who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What did you just do? You're losing your life by trying to save it by looking for the blessing in the better day. Am I saying God won't bless you? Absolutely not. It's a benefit of salvation, but it's not the focal point. When I come to God, I'm not praying, so he comes in a whole new world. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I got cars and houses and barns. This is amazing. I got a million dollars. Lord, you give me stuff. That's a Broadway show. That ain't Jesus. Why? Because if you got stuff before you found out who you were, stuff would have you and the Lord can't. Does God want to bless you? Yes. Does he hate poverty? Yes. He hates it. But if I'm pressing in for prosperity, then money becomes my God and now... It's the root of all evil, and yet I call myself a Christian. Wrong. You gotta understand that. Why? Why does God say that He wants us to prosper even as our soul prospers? Why? Because if my soul is prospering with truth and the reality of who God created me to be and to do, to be, not just to do, but to be and to do. See, I have to be right with God. I have to receive the grace of God. The goodness of God comes after. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But if I'm only focused on the good things that I can get from a good God, I'm in trouble. Then what you're in it for is your sake. You're not in it for his. And you're seeking to save your life, build up your vats and barns and the, the American dream. The American dream is a nightmare, a nightmare. All the stuff you want. All the stuff you want comes with all the bills you want. And when all the bills you want come, all the worries and issues of life are in that place. And you can't afford to go down that road. If God increases blessing upon your life because you're completely submitted, surrendered, and you understand what it means to live kingdom, which is be radically generous on a consistent basis. That means blessing other people. It's not just about you and what you can get for you. Look, he who dies with the most toys doesn't win. <laughs> I hope this is making some kind of sense somewhere to somebody. God, God doesn't mind you having money. He minds your money having you. Jesus is so good, and he's so merciful. 
He really is. I'm amazed. I'm blown away, actually, at how good he really is, man. I'm like, I, I forget what I was doing the other day, but I got like quickly frustrated. I don't know what it was. I, gosh, I don't know. My wife looked at me, she goes, you're really touchy. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm in the fast. We went to a water park and we went camping for two days, three days, two days, two days, Friday, Saturday. It's 100 degrees outside. And I'm not eating anything. And so my energy quickly left me. And I'm like, I'm not doing well. Like, I mean, I'm weak. I'm like, Argh. just like get up. Every time you get up, you get a head rush because your blood is like, your blood sugar is like, But I, I say I'm sorry. Why? Because I don't want to be that way. I don't want to just, I don't want to just be quick. No. I want to be quick to listen. <laughs> I want to be slow to speak. <laughs> you don't understand. See, I read this word, man, every day. It cuts me deep. I am not perfect. But I'm growing. And what astounds me is people that want to grow but never, ever, 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 ever put any seed in the ground. And I'm not talking about dollars, okay? Don't get it confused. I'm talking about this word is seed, man. And when you put this in, you put it in, you're expecting it to grow. God says don't be conformed to the world. So the world has your brain. You get saved, the world has your brain. It's the way we think. It's just, that's how I came up. That's how I was brought up. This is what you do. You look out for number one. That's not God. God is, you look out for him and he looks out for you. He's your provider. He's the one that wants to overwhelm you with truth. Jesus said that the truth would set us free. So we come to Jesus, we come to an altar, we say yes, we walk away, we're good for a couple hours. Then we go home and life starts, bang, bang. And then we're striving for another service, but really we're starving. Because we haven't ate living bread. And we're listening to someone else's bread. And it could be living when it comes out. But God has something for you. Like when I would hear Dan, it would, like something would come alive in me. When I traveled with Dan, I was like, man, that's amazing. But when I went back to try to get the things that he said in the order that he said them, so I take notes. If you'd ever listen to Dan, it's like, oh my gosh. Like he'll say, I'm going to, I want to open up this scripture and then 40 minutes later, you're there and you don't even know how you got there. Well, I wrote it down how I got there. And I'm like, what is this? So when I went to my bedroom, I was so confused. Why? Because God didn't want me to be an echo. God doesn't want anybody to be an echo. He wants you to be a voice. He wants to use your voice. It says, if anybody would speak, let him do so with the oracles of God. God wants you to have your own voice. But you have to be careful that you're not vo your voice isn't the voice of the world. Because our mind is trained by the world. When we get saved, when we get born again, we, we leave darkness and we're in light. We leave this life that we lived before, and now we're in a different place. He takes us out of darkness and conveys us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So now God takes us from lost to found, from blind to see, from dead to alive. But if I don't understand what it means to really be alive, and the Word of God is living, if I don't find out what God's Word says, sometimes I'll incorporate opinions from the life that I just left, and I'll think that that is what I need to tell somebody when they're in trouble. But your opinion to get them out of trouble isn't good. The truth about what God says to help them out of that place, that's where it's at. Are you okay? I'm kind of in teach mode. Are you good? It's calculated. Because if you get this, you won't live in condemnation. You won't live in guilt. You won't live in shame. I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a, so good. Go to Isaiah 53.
Oh my goodness. I'm just going to read. Just hang with me. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up, this is talking about Jesus, before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should even look upon him. So there was nothing, there was nothing attractive about him in the world way like Jesus wasn't the most handsome man alive. There was nothing that drew people to him. In other words, they weren't like, whoa, that guy is like a good-looking guy. Or there was nothing about that. It says that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him, attracted by, or attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and he, we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he has bore and our sorrows he's carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted because he was punished. But he was pierced through for our transgressions or our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our well-being fell upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. He was oppressed and was afflicted. He didn't open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. He did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who, cons who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. In other words, he took our punishment. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Can you imagine being a father and watching all that I don't know how many of you seen the, saw the passion Mel Gibson did the passion movie a while back some people say I can't watch it it's too much you need to tape your eyelids open don't do that but you need to see it because that wasn't as much as it really was It says that it pleased the father to put his son through that. Wow. Look, if my kid, if somebody's going to beat my kid up and I'm watching it, see, I told you, I, I need fast till I die because... Natural instinct. You saw your kid getting beat? You're going to sit there and let him get beat? Some people are like, yeah, my kid deserves it. No. Because <laughs> Jesus wasn't just beat up. The Bible says, if you keep reading in Isaiah, the Bible said that he was marred beyond any man. When they took the scourge, when they whipped him, when you see the passion, the, the leather straps had bone and metal fragments attached to them. So when they whipped Jesus and hit him, all of them latched in. And when they pulled it, all the skin ripped with it. So they scourged all sides. If you saw the passion, you saw how, how gnarly it was. I can't watch it without sobbing because it's so intense. And God, it pleased God to do that to his boy. That's what a good father does. <laughs> Why? Because that good father knew that if Jesus didn't do it, there was no propitiation, there was no substitute, there was no sacrifice.
So he sat back and watched this happen, and he didn't watch it with anger. I can't believe they're beating. God could have stopped it. He could have said, no, done. No, why? Because the Bible says that we were the joy set before him. So now because of our joy, it pleased the Father to bruise the Son, to crush the Son. It pleased God to put His Son through that. It pleased God to kill His Son. That's crazy. I understand He resurrected, but do you understand the brutality and the pain and everything that was there? Guess what? This is what really, I just saw this and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like amazing. It says the chastisement. It says he was pierced for my iniquities. Or he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. The chastening, the chastening, why? What really pleased the Father? See, it's what the man with the, with the mind wants to see. We learn this stuff. We learn this trash from growing up. We learn sin. We're cultivated in sin. Look, we were cultivated by the very enemy of God. We weren't just born in sin only. We were born in sin, but then the cultivation happened where our minds were cultivated by sin itself, by sin itself, by sin itself. So God knew that by crushing his son, by scourging his son, and by chastening his son, why? That our well-being, our shalom, the peace, the reality of our minds finally coming to a place where we actually have peace. Not peace with the world, but peace with God. That's what a loving father did. So what he did was he chastened, he chastened his son, Jesus, and he pleased him. God was pleased. Why? Because you were in his mind. I was on his mind. He knew all the stuff I was going to do. And like when Jesus was going through that, doing this for Todd. <laughs> I'm doing this for Todd. His mind is so gone. He thinks about suicide every day of his life. All he wants to do is kill himself. All he wants to do is kill himself. God sees the end from the beginning. So 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was going through what he was going through, he was going through it for me. And I take that so personal. People get so mad when I say, Jesus didn't just die for your sin. And what people take it as, well, God's, Todd's saying that Jesus didn't die for our sin. No, I'm not. That's part of it. Gosh. Jesus was marred beyond any man. You couldn't even tell who it was. You couldn't tell who it was. Why did he have to go through that? Yes, for our healing, but it is healing, but it's complete overhaul healing. It's not just physical healing. It's our spirit, our soul, and our body. He was more beyond even, you couldn't even recognize him. He was unrecognizable, why? Because we've been cultivated by sin itself, cultivated by the enemy, born in sin. He had to become completely unrecognizable because that's what we are before Jesus. God created us in his image and in the likeness of man, and in the likeness of God, he made man. So now all of us, we're nothing like we were created to be. So Jesus became completely messed up beyond description because we were completely messed up beyond description. The dangerous thing is self-righteousness, thinking that your description without Jesus is presentable. You're unrecognizable to the very God that created you. That's why it says to put on Christ. That's why it says to be not conformed to this world. Because you look like the world, you smell like the world, you think like the world, you react like the world. You talk like the word world, you respond like the world. But when your mind gets transformed, you respond like Jesus. You would walk like Jesus. You would talk like Jesus. You would act like Jesus. Todd White says you can act like Jesus. No, Todd White says the Bible says in Ephesians 5 to be an imitator of God. 
and walk in love. Todd White says that First John says that if you would say that you abide in him, if you would say, if anybody would say that you abide in him. Now I want you to understand that John truly knew the Lord. He was the one that knew he was the disciple that Jesus loved. John is the disciple that knew he was loved. I want to be the one that knows he's loved. You can't be loved any more than when the day you said yes and you re the reality that God was real and that God so loved the world that he gave his son. But you can grow in your understanding of that love. You can grow in your understanding of who God really created you to be because he created you in his likeness. We lost it. Adam forfeited it. What happened? Our minds were cultivated by the very enemy of God. So now, with a heart one believes, we say yes to God. And what happens is a lot of people walk away from the altar, changed, but they don't step into transformation. So they're changed here, but still corrupt here. Now all of a sudden, all those old things are still there. But as we get in this, and the first thing that has to hit your soul, is the chastisement for our peace was placed upon Jesus. Why? Because we had no peace. So Jesus, do you, do you know what it would be like? I mean, none of us do know, but imagine being with God always. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, always together, the Trinity never separated, ever. Jesus humbles himself, comes here, People get so upset. They're like, Todd takes away divinity. He's saying that Jesus wasn't God. Wrong. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was born on this earth and he lived here, if he walked in his divinity rights, he couldn't have gone to the cross. Jesus was fully God and fully man. But for a season of 33 and a half years, he had to lay aside his right to act things out as God. Are you with me? That is not taking divinity away from God. Jesus is fully God and fully man, period. I 100%, I 1,000%, I 100% 10 times over believe that. He's fully God and fully man. He was both God and man. But when he came here, in order for him to walk out the law, and be tempted at all points, yet without sin. He had to do it as the son of man. He had to, he had to let go of his divinitive rights to act it out as God. Because God's not going to sin. But Jesus had to be tempted. So he had to have the ability to sin. He had to. So watch. That's why when we pray to, Je when we pray to God, Jesus can understand what we're tempted with and what we go through. Why? Because he's not, he is seated at the right hand of God. The man, read Hebrews, the man, Christ Jesus, in your stead as a high priest. Why? Because he has to be able to sympathize with what I'm going through. So he knows what I'm going through and he knows I can get through it. Why? Because he went through it as the son of man. Fully God, fully man. But he had to lay those rights aside for 33 and a half years in order to bring us back to the Father. Jesus had peace. Why would the chastisement of our peace go upon him? Because we didn't have it. Jesus had no sin. Then how did he become sin? Because that's what we were. So he who knew no sin, never sin, became sin. Why? So I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's amazing. It's the gospel. It really is. I didn't just give myself to an altar call. I gave myself to a lifetime of going after God with everything in me. Everything in me. Everything in me. Do I know it all? No. But I know it more than I did yesterday. You know what stops me? Sin. Lying. Stealing. 
pornography, cheating, fornication, idolatry. All these things, they all stop me from intimacy. Because you can't live that and be intimate. You can't live those things and be intimate. Listen, it is so important that we get this. This isn't legalism. Because what I said to the Lord the other day, I'm like, Lord, I, the message is so intense. Because I'm, I was, like last Sunday I was here. And I, I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, this is so intense. I don't want to go here. No, 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 it's okay. Why? Because none of the things that I say is lashing out. None of the th- I'm not angry at anybody. See, I would take a bullet for anybody, any day, anywhere. It doesn't matter. I'm going to go be with God. When it's time, it's time. I'm okay with that. But I can't afford to have somebody stand before God prematurely before they deal with their own issues. Why? Because they're going to answer for it when you stand before Him. This life is a dressing room for eternity. I am just in the dressing room right now. This is a very, look, how short is the time we're here compared to eternity? It's eternity. I want everybody there with me. I want people that don't know Jesus to see something in me, to hear something in me that's not of this world. Your life lived is the best weapon you have. But your life lived outside of peace isn't the weapon that you need. The peace that I have. See, the peace that I have is a violation of others that don't have it. Jesus said, I I have come to give you peace, not like the world gives it. The world can give peace from drugs. The world can give peace from sex. The world can give peace from winning. The world can give peace from gambling. The world can give peace from being famous. The world can give peace from getting married. The world can give peace from this, that, and the other thing. Lots of people have that kind of peace, but it's short-lived. Because when trials and tribulations and all those things come, that peace is history, buddy. Jesus said, I have peace to give you that this world can't give. The peace that I want to give you surpasses understanding, goes way beyond knowledge. Like the most books you could possibly read, it's way beyond that. The peace that God wants to give is this. Jesus, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. So Romans 5.1 says, therefore, being justified by faith, having peace with God. You have peace with the one that created you. When that peace centralizes itself in your heart and your mind, you will step into a place called rest that you will never leave. The rest that Jesus wants to give you is to cease from your works trying to earn it. We, we grow up that way. All of us did. Like performance, sports, you're only as good as your last game. You're only as good as your last score, your, your last spike, your last goal, your last, your last basket, your last touchdown, your last try in rugby. You're, you're only as good as your last performance. On your job, you're only as good as you're performing. If you're doing peace work, you're only as good as you're doing a lot of pieces. Like, it's the same thing over and over and over and over. We have to leave that way of thinking when we come into the kingdom and see that peace is something that we cannot earn. It is something that has been given. And when I step into that peace, when I open the Bible, I'm no longer at war with God. See, when I'm still trying to do it myself, you're still hosting a war against the Father. That doesn't mean that responsibilities get less. That just means that you know that you fail miserably on your own performance and you need to actually write on Jesus' report card and not yours. Because you get an A plus every day. (laughs) I hope this makes any sense at all. Gosh, I feel like I'm, Bob. It's actually profound. It is. Condemnation, guilt, and shame. And regret are some of the nastiest. See, people think that when I speak, 
I have a war against certain ministries. Like people are like, Todd White, he, he hates inner healing. He hates this. No, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't despise anybody. I don't despise ministries. I despise looking back. Why? Because he paid a price for me to look forward, not look back. But I am not against anybody or anything. We're all in this together. But I am not for digging up someone's past to try to get them to their present. But am I for exposing lies? Absolutely. But I'm not going to go fishing to try to find them. I'm not going to go fishing because a lot of times we don't come up with any fish. We just got the hook. And the devil took the bait. A lot of times we go fishing to try to find out what's wrong. Well, obviously you must, there must have been something. I mean, let's go back and take you back to your mother's womb. Maybe you were rejected there. I got news, you were born in sin. So when you were born, you were born in sin. Whether your mom rejected you, whether your dad accepted you, all that stuff. Listen, none of that matters. What matters is you must be born again. You must be, and we better start there. If you don't start from the finished work, it's to be continued until you figure out it's been finished. And you're going through work to get to the finished. That was really good. Why? Because there's so many people doing this, trying to get to the very place that God says they already are. There's nothing you can do to add to it, but you can... Like the children of Israel would have taken them 11 days to get to the promised land. It took 40 years. Most of them, all the parents and everybody over 20 died in the wilderness and only people under 20 went in with Joshua. So what you can do is you can spend your whole life going around or you can go straight in. <laughs> you can go straight in or you can go around the mountain, man. I will not go around the mountain. I won't. I will not go around the mountain. You know, I talked about the mountain. I talked about the children and how they freaked out, screaming, saying, Moses, you talk to them. If we do, we'll die. Moses is like, no, no, no. You got to. God wants to put this in you so that you don't sin against him. The fear of the Lord isn't a scary thing. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is loving what God loves and despising what he despises. You know what God loves? People. You know what God will never get hurt by? People. You know what he hurts for? People. You know what he wants to put in us? Not being hurt by people, but hurting for people. Actually going and crying out for them. Jesus vehement cries came out of Jesus for the very people that hated him. <laughs> God wants us to be there. He wants this to be in perfect peace and stop going. <laughs> people try to get quiet. Well, I try to get still, but when I do, it's louder inside than it was outside. Why? Life. We need to be in that place where we can fall in love with Jesus again. Because God loves you so much. I told somebody today, I tell them every day, Jesus loves you so much. I told him yesterday, thanks, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. God so loved the world. God does love people. They need to see his love. They need to see the victory of Calvary, the victory of the cross. I really feel in my heart when that word rest came, there's a lot of people wrestling of that very thing. And it's not just performance in your job. It's that hamster wheel of life, that continuing cycle that just seems to never end. I promise you that the cross is the only way. That relationship is the only way. We want to pray for you tonight. We really do. It's so important to me. See, I, I want this building. We launched church September 27th. I'm excited. This is like, 
our night service, but we're going to launch the morning service. I want the identity message to be so solid that when we leave this place, we are looking for somebody that can be transformed. We are looking for somebody because we're so excited about our Father that we have to tell people. Amen. We're so excited. Like, it's like a, this, this fresh baptism of love on a consistent basis where you, you know, oh my gosh, I have to tell that person I'm tired. No, it's not about that. They're going to be lost forever unless they find Him. And you're the one that's coming across their path. So what if you said, hey, I just want to tell you that God, God just is so serious about you. <laughs> what? No one's ever said that before. What's that mean? And then you go into what he's done. Just go into Calvary. Go into Jesus. Go into the price that he paid for them to know what freedom looks like. And all of a sudden you start to make like this, just these bonds with people. And all of a sudden, you just keep sowing and keep watering and keep sowing and keep watering. See, God is a God that requires repentance. Repentance is changing the way that we think. But if, I don't, if I'm in a place of repentance and I don't feel bad about the place that I was, something's wrong. But repentance is more than just changing the way you think because you could just put another worldly mindset in there. John the Baptist said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. How can someone bear fruit worthy of repentance? See, if you repent, your actions change. If you repent, your habits change. Why is it not good to come home from work and watch TV for four hours and go to bed? Because you just fed yourself the world for four hours. So now you wake up more like the world than you were yesterday. That doesn't mean that I'm against TV. That just means that if you're only giving God a teeny bit, you might want to try something else. Like your whole life. We can't afford to be worldly Christians. Although we're in the world, we're not supposed to be of it. You are supposed to be a pilgrim passing through, a sojourner, a traveler. Even though you go to the same house every day, and you go to the same job every day, you're still a pilgrim. You don't belong to this world. Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me. My question, I guess, is does the world have something in you? Or does Jesus? The Bible says if anybody says that they abide in him, he ought walk just as he walked. It says if anybody has this hope in him, this is, this is John, he ought purify himself just as he is pure. That's some heavy verbiage. Can I get the worship team out here? I know I always have keys. It's like the invisible key person. It's amazing. I'm like totally blown away. It's amazing. I really believe... God's helping me with patience. I've asked him to help me. I need more. And when you fast, my goodness. Why? Because James said, James says, and that was Jesus' brother, by the way. Jacob was his original name, but the word, the book of James says, Trials produce patience, patience produces character, character produces hope. But James says, let patience have its perfect work in you so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Amen. 
So watch this. The only way to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, is to let patience have its perfect work in you. Why? How patient is God? Some of the things that we've done, it's amazing he didn't just smote us. People are like, well, well, I don't believe in this and I don't believe in that. Man, why didn't God just wipe you out? Because he loves you. Well, I don't believe that. Well, gosh. If God got to wait till I get to heaven to be free, then death has become my savior. I can't do that. If whom the Son sets free is free indeed, then I need to live in that freedom. And then I need to lead others to freedom. But freedom isn't sinning and getting away with it. Freedom is being free from sin, the want to sin, the tendency to sin, to where you're to where your constant fall becomes an occasional slip, to where your occasional slip becomes a, a little bit of a hiccup, to where your hiccups become far and in between. Not because you're trying to walk the line, because you're living life on your knees. And I'm by no means perfect. And I by no means don't mess, like never mess up. But if I do mess up, I am really quick to repent and go straight to God because I have full access to Jesus as my lawyer. But I'm not waking up going, man, I hope I don't sin today. Oh my God. No, I wake up going, oh God, I love you. The last thing I'm thinking about is when I'm going to miss it. And I don't have this thing in me that willfully has to sin. I'm not perfect, but I'm in love. Jesus says, he who loves me obeys my commandments. He who doesn't love me does not. The commandments didn't change. They're still there. We are not bound to walk out the law. We are bound to live in the reality of grace, ball and chain to Jesus. We have become slaves of righteousness. We were slaves to sin. We had no idea. But then we got saved and became slaves unto righteousness. But when you see that you're right with God, all of a sudden that tendency to have a hiccup gets further and further and further and further away. Why? Because rest comes because you're no longer at war with God. That is the rest that Jesus paid a price for us to enter into. If you look at Hebrews, it talks about rest. It's be diligent to enter. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. No, a rest remains for us. When you come in, you enter in through the narrow gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the road to destruction. But when you come in to that narrow gate called Jesus, and you enter in, it's so much bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. And you find that that kingdom isn't something that's out here. That kingdom comes to make its home in here. It's the kingdom of God. It's not meat or drink or stuff or houses or this or that. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit wants to cultivate intimacy and relationship with you to where the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When grace hits you, it empowers you to walk out what truth calls you to. Grace empowers you to forgive and to walk in forgiveness. Grace empowers you to walk in love and never in hate. Grace empowers you to not be offended, but to be uplifted and to cry out for somebody's soul because they're headed for eternal destruction. We don't want that. And if there's anybody that's praying for somebody to get it, pray God, get them. Be careful. Because first, God wants to get you. Worthy Lord, 
Father, I thank you so much for your people. Jesus, you said if anybody is weary, if anybody is worn out from trying to perform, from trying to get to you on their own way, on their own works, through their own stuff, Jesus says, let them come to me and you will give them rest. If there's anybody here right now that has been trying to do all the right things, yet is failing miserably, and you actually want to enter in the right way, and you want to experience real freedom, freedom that only Calvary can give you, freedom that the chastisement of our peace was upon him so that you could actually have shalom, the peace of God now, that it could reign now in your life, right now. If there's anybody that needs that, if you would like to pledge everything to the King of glory and you want that in your life, I want you to come up here right now. in this place showers of mercy and grace falling on every face there is freedom Jesus reigns in this place Showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face There is freedom Jesus Jesus Jesus, we say yes to you We say yes to you with every part of our being we are tired of running in circles. We are tired of running around like a chicken with his head cut off. We are tired of performance. We are tired of doing, 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 and never hitting the mark. Because all of us have sinned and all of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody can make it in their own strength. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need a revelation of Calvary. We need a revelation of the cross, of the reality of who our great King was and is and is to come. We need warriors that walk in peace and love and gentleness and kindness. We need people that would love God and not hold things against people, but would cry out for people. Christ, it's time to fully surrender to our King. It's time to let this book challenge everything that we think. Everything that we think needs to be challenged by this word of truth. Jesus is Lord, 
None of us are Lord. Jesus is Lord. None of us are Lord. You are God, and we are not. Jesus reigns. Come on. God, reign in here. Reign in our hearts. Reign in our hearts. God, we love you. Here is the life. The real life, the abundant life, is in stuff. The abundant life is being free from sin, free from junk. The abundant life. The abundant life. If you're backslidden and you want to slide home, come to the altar. Come to Jesus. Go play. Let's do this. Let's run together. Like-minded. Jesus. Come on. Who else? Who else? Who else is holding back on God? Who else thinks I'm just okay? I'm good. It's not okay to be just okay. It's only good to be outrageously in love with the Father. Come on, let's all pray right now. Come on, lift your voice, lift your voice. thoughts right now in Jesus name we command every suicidal thought to go in Jesus name right now right now in Jesus name every suicidal thought we command it to go in Jesus name father we thank you for complete wholeness and peace in Jesus name the shalom of heaven the shalom of heaven the chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus so we can live in it. I thank you for freedom right now. 
Holy Spirit, we ask you to come right now more in Jesus' name. Increase depression. I break you in the name of Jesus right now. I break your power. The power of lies. Depression is nothing but lies. We silence the stranger's voice. And we say today, we want to have a clear hearing of the Father's voice, of our shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And that is who leads us into green pastures besides still waters. God, I thank you for more. I ask you for more right now. We command bipolar to go in Jesus' name right now. We command those voices to stop. In Jesus' name, 100% complete freedom. I want you to pray with me right now. Lord God, we have sinned against heaven and we don't ever want to do it again. Help us to be steadfast, to go after you like you go after us. We say yes to Calvary, yes to the gospel. We turn our back on sin and we're asking you to give us a new heart and a new mindset. Help us be hungry for the word of truth. In Jesus' name.